So welcome everyone to the uh, hearing on the Department of Technology. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. Uh, Councilmember Mitch Brown for joining us uh, for this hearing. I'll start with some opening remarks and then look forward to the presentation by the department. And thank you all for taking the time to educate us. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank everyone, including the Interim Department of Technology Director, Sherry Kish, who unfortunately cannot be here today uh, for your participation in this hearing. Uh, other staff members from the Department of Technology are here to present helpful information and will be led by our Assistant Director, Tom Diamond. I would also like to thank members of the public for taking the time to come down to City Hall to learn more about how our city's Department of Technology keeps Columbus up and running. I'd also like to remind those members of the public that want to testify to please fill out a speaker slip and after the presentation we'll have a public testimony portion of the hearing. Today we will hear about what the Department of Technology provides to the residents and visitors of Columbus. As a new member of council, what everyone always asks is, what are you chairing? What does that department do? Uh, and so really appreciate the Department of Technology taking the time to share some of that what do we do. Uh, we'll learn useful information about Columbus TV, otherwise known as CTV, emerging applications, the Columbus.gov website, GreenSpot Columbus, the My Columbus app, which if you haven't downloaded yet, you should do that either while watching this hearing or in your leisure. Uh, 311, Geographic Information Systems, Network Data Security, and the Columbus Fiber Network. The information presented today will illustrate the City of Columbus's strong leadership from the Department of Technology that promotes effectiveness and opportunity. This hearing is, publicly, is public and will be available on the Columbus.gov YouTube channel, uh, which is also currently streaming live online on the CTV website and broadcasting on Time Warner and WOW on Channel 3 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. I don't know if my colleague has any opening remarks or comments. Seeing none, I will now turn over the presentation uh, to Assistant Director Tom Diamond. Again, thank you all for being here. Tom, Absolutely. the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Councilmember Stenziano, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Brown, for, uh, for inviting us here today. On behalf of Sherry Kish, who's our interim director, um, to, uh, she thanks you as well and um, allowing us to talk about the good work of the Department of Technology. I'm joined today by um, some talented city staff that we have here. We have Nicole Woodward, and uh, she is the manager of the Emerging Application section. We have uh, Sheree Elhami, who is the, uh, the manager of GIS Citywide. We have Bill White, who is the manager of, uh, well, actually, he is the uh, enterprise architect, and that's enterprise in the technology sense, not necessarily in my, uh, my old development hat sense, so um, that's Bill. We have David Celebrezzi, who is actually the, the, um, with Public Utilities. He's the uh, Columbus Green Spot coordinator. And then we also have Andy Stout here as well, who is uh, with CTV. So. Um, um, before focusing on today's topic, which is the citizen access, I always like to take the opportunity to, um, to focus on some of the other work of the Department of Technology. Um, I'll briefly go over some of this information. Um, on a daily basis, the department uh, manages nearly $11 million of uh, City of Columbus technology contracts. Um, also, we have the uh, responsibility of the development and support of major City of Columbus uh, technology systems, including the uh, revenue generating systems of income tax and also the utilities billing system, 311, and the building permit system as well. Um, we procure and develop uh, and deploy and support over 10,000 uh, network devices. They include desktop computers, tablets, we have laptop computers, telephones, and mobile devices as well. Um, and also the management and operation of two data centers storing over 1.8 petabytes, and that's a lot of storage. It's basically the equivalent of 10 billion digital photographs, so that's a lot of uh, storage that we have there, on over 550 servers. We have a nationally recognized and award-winning geographic information systems team, and then um, we also um, manage the... Uh, the network of over 500 miles of fiber that allows for quick and efficient transfer data between city facilities and the development of user-friendly and award-winning web and mobile application devices. So that's just part of the, um, our uh, department overview. Now I'd like to, uh, to focus some time on um, one section of the Department of Technology that focuses specifically on citizen access, and that would be CTV. CTV is available on Time Warner Channel 3, also, WOW Cable Channel 3, we have UVerse Channel 99, and it's uh, available um, 
with live streaming on both columbus.gov forward slash CTV and also the My Columbus app. Um, CTV is actually a 24 hour, seven day a week cable channel that provides local government news and information to the couple, uh, cable and online subscribers. Um, in 2015, they produced close to 300 hours of on-air programming, including meetings of Columbus City Council and the Franklin County Commissioners. And the, uh, the potential reach of CTV is over one million local cable subscribers and an infinite number of online and application uh, or the mobile app, My Columbus Users. So um, that's CTV. Go ahead. So, and I apologize, I didn't really lay it out. I was hoping as we kind of hit each section, if I could ask some questions uh, that members of the public have asked, and I think this is a wonderful form in which to Absolutely. get those answered. Absolutely. So regarding CTV, um, some people have asked, particularly the scrolls. So I know there's potentially two channels. Uh, if a member or an organization of our community was interested in being part of that scroll, uh, what is that process? Is there somewhere they can go? Is it contact the department? Is it contact the chair of the committee? Uh, any information you could share if people or businesses want to share some of the community events that sure. they have going on? That'd be on. Um, and first of all, those are uh, that option exists for nonprofit organizations, and that information would appear on um, CTV's sister channel, which would be the Community Bulletin Board on Channel 21. That's correct, Andy. Yes. Great. And um, basically, uh, what they would need to do then is uh, provide the information the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. Um, send that in an email to community bulletin board at columbus.gov. The, uh, the Department of Technology is also looking at uh, other ways that the uh, community can actually submit that information as well. So something that we're looking into right now. The only other thing, um, the size of the staff of CTV. Um, I don't think people always get or understand the credit that goes into the work. Um, obviously, when we are able to go out into the community and some of that's captured, uh, just curious if you could share what the size of the staff currently is. Sure. And Andy, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I've never been up here before. Mm. Uh, uh, the staff is consists of myself, two full-time uh, writer producers, uh, one full-time engineer and uh, three part-time people, and that's it. <laughs> Information's always helpful, thank you. Yes. Councilman Brown, do you have any questions on CTV? All right, then we'll keep and, uh, I wanna take this time to thank Andy and the crew of CTV for always, uh, I've been with the city for quite a while now and I've known Andy from day one and I think that it's always great to uh, have the people that are behind the scenes come out front and uh, to be recognized some of that stuff as well. So, I know um, that is always their favorite opportunity is to absolutely. come out from behind the scenes. <laughs> so thank you and thank your staff. Absolutely. I'd now like to uh, turn it over to Nicole Woodward, um, who will uh, discuss some um, of our uh, web offerings and also the mobile application stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. As Tom mentioned, my name is Nicole Woodward. I manage the Emerging Applications Development Team. I have an amazing staff of five that creates and maintains nearly 50 applications, three of which I'm gonna to highlight today. Uh, we have a large focus on citizen-facing apps within our team um, and an emphasis on ease of use. We want all the websites to have a similar look and feel um, for consistency. So we're, we've utilized the city branding, the city color scheme, and some similar templates so that you have the same usability from page to page. We, have, um, we were one of 214 sites out of 6,000 government sites to receive the Sunny Award for transparency and accessibility. We are in the top 1% of over 1 billion websites worldwide. We've got nearly 5,000 visitors each day. Uh, we've got over 3,300 sites that contain links back to columbus.gov. So that's other entities that find information on columbus.gov to be valuable enough to include a link back to it. Ohio State is one of those entities. They have a lot of links back to columbus.gov to share that information and get the message out. 41% of our users are accessing Columbus.gov from a mobile device. Uh, this is important as more and more people get um, 
smartphones, um, we'll see this number climb. Uh, this is important for Columbus.gov because we've all been to web pages on our phone where you have to kind of scroll left, right, up, down to see the whole page. You won't have to do that on Columbus.gov because we've made it responsive in that the page will rebuild so that you can see the information in a stacked view and then just kind of scroll through it nicely on your phone um, for an easier user experience. With over 9,000 pages, the Columbus.gov website offers a lot of information. Um, some examples of that are you can pay your utility bills, you can apply for a parking permit, you can look up your street sweeping schedule, and we can highlight programs such as Get Active and the Columbus Green Spot program, which Dave is going to talk about here in a minute. At this time, I can take questions about Columbus.gov. So love the website, really have found it user friendly as I navigate and get caught up to speed with the city. Uh, one question that someone did raise uh, in a community forum was about press releases and whether or not they're made available on the website. Press releases are available on the web website and we've made them convenient right on the home page. Um, actually, you can see on this slide, there's the news and alerts. Press releases are always put in that news section. Um, for added exposure, that news and alert section is also fed up to the My Columbus mobile application. So the exact same information is displayed in two different places to reach a broader audience. A question, how often do, like, do, do snow removal, do, we, do they put snow removal on the website as well? Snow removal? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Warrior Watch, which Sheree is going to talk about here in a minute, is um, actually highlighted at the bottom of the home page on Columbus.gov. So it's easily accessible um, via Columbus.gov as, as well as the My Columbus mobile application. And how frequently do we update it? All this information, how frequently on the website, how often do we do the, do the update? Oh, it's constantly updated. We have editors in every department um, that are, are focused on keeping their information up to date. Okay. Okay, with that, we're going to transition over to David. Thank you for the clicker. Uh, David's one of our business partners and one of our favorite business partners. He's going to talk about GreenSpot today. Sure. Great. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Councilmember Brown, Chair Cintiano, thanks for this opportunity to talk about GreenSpot, Columbus GreenSpot. It's a program that lives at Department of Public Utilities, and it, its mission is really to inspire, educate, and recognize households, businesses, nonprofits, community groups that uh, adopt sustainable actions. And since the program started in 2008, uh, we have more than 12,000 members. We have more than uh, 2,300 Facebook likes and more than 250 Twitter followers. Um, as I said, it provides a framework to go green. And uh, it's an example, too, of, uh, with the new website and the metrics, uh, interdepartmental collaboration with uh, Department of Technology. With the metrics component now, uh, our members can go online and they can actually track what they're doing to be green and it'll accumulate over time so they can see their impact. They'll also be able to see the impact they're having uh, in the larger green spot universe. Um, so uh, here, uh, we took uh, feedback from the community and we've incorporated a number of different changes to make the, the viewer experience, uh, a, a, quite frankly, a better experience viewing and navigating the website. Uh, at the left-hand side, you'll see a, a lot of different programs and those programs in the quick links box, and those programs make up uh, the Columbus Green Spot program. We also have a carousel at the top that highlights uh, upcoming events, also some large initiatives and some successes, and the home page does the same thing as well. If you uh, un click under the, um, the Learn tab, the viewer will see um, the different options in which uh, somebody can become a member of GreenSpot. So let's go ahead and take a look at the household. So the household has tips on how to be green, and at the top of the page, it has the benefits of a household uh, being a green spot member. And one thing we, we tried to do on every, well, on every page, at least have one area where somebody could click join us or become a member today uh, to make it easy for them to, to join green spot. So uh, with that, let's say we uh, uh, go ahead and click join us. It's going to take you to this page. And uh, you'll see at the bottom there's links so uh, the community members and businesses could preview the application. Uh, we'll go ahead and let's say we click on the household. Uh, after uh, you fill out information about uh, address, email, and name, 
then you have the opportunity to really highlight what you're doing to be green. So we ask our, our members to commit to do at least two things uh, to conserve and protect water, two things to conserve energy, and two things to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And this has something for everybody, whether you're a homeowner or a renter. After you fill out that, after you go through that process, you'll have your own dashboard. Uh, and it looks like this. At the top, you can see how many commitments you've made. You can actually change the number of commitments if you'd like. The, the second section is the number of, or the, uh, where you, the, the member could enter in the metrics of what they're doing to be green, and that'll calculate over time. Then there's a, a reminder section, a did you know section, and then finally, but not least at the bottom, there's uh, the number of, of uh, pledges that our members have made under each of those three categories. And uh, hopefully by, uh, by the end of this year, we'll have an additional column there that will calculate the environmental benefits as well as the cost benefits to our members of, of being green spots. So in closing, uh, these technologies and the, the upgrade design are essential for communicating our message to the public, and it provides ideas, resources, and a framework for uh, the public to go green. It really is easy being green. Thank you. So if you don't mind, I do have a few questions. Um, similar to most of the department, until I became a council member, I wasn't aware of some of these things, although uh, I've been a lifelong resident. Uh, is Green Spot for Columbus residents only? Uh, it, Green spots actually uh, for anybody, really. Uh, whether you're in Columbus or not in Columbus, uh, we just ask, you know, it's a voluntary program, and uh, we just like getting the word out there to, to folks to join. So in getting that word out, are there any membership uh, goals or, you know, aspirations mm -hmm. that the program's trying to achieve or just get the word out and there are. kind of what's most comfortable for everyone? There are. So our, our goal is to, to get 2,000 members each year, so we reach 20,000 members by 2020. Uh, certainly, uh, we'd love to exceed that goal, but that's the, the goal. And we do that through a number of different ways, through uh, uh, being out in the community at, at various festivals and events, uh, talking to community groups, uh, leading a, a Green Spot course for businesses, uh, just a, a lot of different avenues that we get the word out. And my final question, and having signed up and then talking to Mr. Diamond uh, about not only uh, providing ideas to be green, but what are some of the benefits uh, when you are participating in Green Spot? Sure. So for the, the household, uh, you get a letter uh, from Mayor Ginther as well as a Green Spot decal that you can put up on, on your window. Uh, and you can let your neighbors know that you're green. Uh, it does provide that framework. It provides ideas. We also have the Green Spot Backyard Program that we uh, that our friends at Franklin uh, Soil and Water Conservation District administer for us. So there's rebates available for household members on uh, native trees, uh, compost bins, uh, native plants, and, and uh, um, I always forget the, the last one. But there's a number of rebates that are out there. Uh, uh, for our members. For businesses, uh, there, there's some promotional things that uh, we can do that we base uh, that on their annual report that they submit. We have a monthly highlight on our Green Spot Facebook page um, to highlight some of the, the good works that they're doing. Uh, I could probably go on for another hour, but I'll just, I better not. <laughs> We're happy you're here. You can take as much time as you want. Don't know if Councilmember Brown has any you questions. You mentioned something about a Green Spot course for business? Yeah. Correct. So what, what does that entail? Correct. So each year we take about uh, uh, six to ten businesses. We keep the course uh, limited because we want to have interaction with those businesses. And it creates a forum for those businesses to talk to one another about what they've done uh, to go green and their successes as well as their obstacles. One thing that we've found is that you know, one business might do really well at, at energy efficiency. Maybe they've taken advantage of some rebate programs and have installed LED lighting, uh, but maybe they're having trouble instituting a recycling policy and they don't know where to start. And there'll be a business in the group that's kind of flipped so they could talk to one another. And we also bring in experts from the outside to tell them about the uh, different programs that are available for them. And it also gives us an opportunity as a city to let them know of our experience of, for instance, instituting the recycling program or, or changing out the light bulbs and things like that. Um, those businesses are then uh, uh, recognized, or we kind of say they graduate uh, from uh, the Green Spot Sustainability Initiative at our Green Spotlight celebration, which happens uh, in every spring, and uh, they're recognized. The mayor hands them certificates of recognition uh, for their completion of the course. Uh, the course meets uh, once a month for six months uh, with that culmination of graduation. If I want to get rid of a refrigerator, what do I do? 
So to get rid of a refrigerator, uh, I would send you a link to, well, there's a couple things. One on a, a department or the uh, a refuses website, there's this called a waste wizard that we just mm -hmm. uh, put out there recently. And uh, you can type in, how do I get rid of a refrigerator? And it'll uh, generate results of where you can actually do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you. Very helpful and informative. Thank you, Tom. So now we're moving on to the My Columbus mobile application. Several years ago, the City of Columbus set out to create a single mobile application for all city services. So we decided to create one mobile application to avoid any confusion of downloading multiple applications and then having to remember which app serves what, what function. So um, everything is currently combined into one app. It's available on Android and um, Apple phones. We've got over 25,000 downloads at this point. Um, the best, cu best customer app site award was given to us in 2014. Um, site is a company called Consumerization of IT in the Enterprise. It's a subsidiary of IDG, which is International Data Group. They publish magazines such as um, CIO Magazine, Computer World, and IT World. We've had over 12,500 service requests entered into the 311 section of My Columbus to date. My Columbus offers several services. One of the most popular services is the collection reminders. As we all know, we have a rolling um, collection schedule for uh, trash, yard waste, and recycling here in Columbus. So with the app, you can enter your address, and then the night before your collection day, um, it will pop up a reminder to say, don't forget to put out your trash cans or your yard waste or your recycling. This is a favorite feature um, of a lot of our customers. Um, we've also got something we call the red alert bar. It's not always red, but it's a place to highlight information um, that's happening in Columbus. Uh, we typically save red for emergency or you know, critical type information, but this is where you would find a warrior watch, the snow removal in the winter during you know, a big snow day. We've also put things on there like school closings and election results. Um, we kind of reserve that for timely information. Um, we've got news and alerts on there as well, but the red alert bar is more so, like I said, for the timely information. The app is then broken down into separate components. We've got the My Neighborhood function, which is intended to show you um, things available in and around you. It's a, it's a combination of city information as well as public information. So say, for example, you were looking for a daycare. You could pull up the app in the daycare section and find a daycare in and around you. We've also got things under my neighborhoods like traffic cams that might help you with your commute home and capital projects. The 311 call center section, we're gonna um, delve into a little bit more in a minute, but you can submit 311 service requests via the My Columbus mobile application, as well as see, view the status of your request. Get Active is another program within the My Columbus mobile application. It's got activities, um, information in there, how to, how to be active and um, there's an art walk program that you can pull up and it will show you um, pictures, text, and audio about landmarks and historical sites in Columbus as it walks you through this route around the city. So there are several different routes that the um, health department has put in there um, to kind of combine being active with some of the historic landmarks in, in Columbus. You can also find sports information if, say, you, you participate in one of the city's athletic leagues, like, you know, if you have a softball game and you're concerned whether it's rained out, you can find that out on the app as well. The Green Spot application, the Green Spot piece of it, um, David just talked about that is also available via the My Columbus mobile application. You can view the information as well as sign up to be a Green Spot member. Um, city Jobs is a section we added in 2015. Um, you can see all the open job postings um, within the city of Columbus, police, fire, and any of the departmental listings as well. Okay, so 311. Um, in this section, I'm going to talk about the 311 um, service offerings via the website as well as the mobile application. As far as 311 itself goes, you can contact 311 in a, a variety of ways. You can call, you can visit via the My Columbus mobile app, and you can go to columbus.gov slash 311. 
There are 473 types of service requests that the 311 call center um, will accept. Those are anything from potholes to street lights to bulk collection. We have found that um, by including a photo with the service request, in a lot of instances that service request gets resolved um, more quickly. We believe this is because the photo includes a lot of information that the person resolving the service request request might need. So for example, graffiti. If you submit a service request about graffiti on a city sign or a building, um, by including a photo, the person who goes out to resolve that issue can take the right amount of material with them to either cover it up or remove the graffiti. You can also check on a service request. You can look near your current location. Um, if you, you're going by the mobile app, you can search near a specific address or you can put in the email address that you may have used to submit your service request to see what the status of it is. These are kind of helpful because if you see a pothole, you might want to look for any service requests around me to see if somebody has already submitted it so you don't you know, submit a second one. We also offer something called a knowledge base. This is a list of FAQs or just facts that the 311 call center has compiled over the years with all the calls that they have resolved. So it includes links within the city as well as to sites outside the city um, to answer questions that people might have. There's lots of information in there that was recently made public so people can you know, empower themselves to go find the information. 311 has increased in popularity over the years. So in 2005, we had 135,000 service requests entered via 311. In 2015, we increased that number to 317,000 service requests. This graph is to depict the top 10 types of service requests that we've seen over the years. Bulk collection is always number one. So as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, your refrigerator or, you know, a couch or whatever you might have, baby strollers, Christmas trees, camping tents, all kinds of stuff are picked up via bulk, bulk collection. There's over 100 different types of items that are collected via the bulk collection schedule. Um, code violations are also a big Big number on the top 10, those are things like weeds, high grass, trash, you know, on a neighbor's property. Um, if, if you're unhappy with that, you can submit a service request and have the city come out and take a look. Refuse is also um, on the top 10. If you have a container that maybe has been damaged or needs replaced, you can submit a service request to get that, that fulfilled. Okay, so that's kind of it for my Columbus and 311. Are there any questions? Councilmember Brown, I'll let you begin any questions you may have. Okay. So I do have a few questions then. Okay. Uh, you mentioned winning the best customer app by site. Uh, who was the competition for that award? Absolutely. Uh, how thank big you. was that competition? Okay, thank you for asking. Yes, so in, in that category, um, it wasn't just a, a government submission. So we competed against private companies um, for this award. A couple of the examples of the ones in our category were the Hertz Corp Corporation, the car rental company, um, uh, the Insurance Auto Auctions Incorporated, and Trade Monster Group. Um, we were in good company in general in the, in the uh, competition because NASA, True Value, and DirecTV were also winners of other categories. So we can send uh, some council members to space if we figure out our apps correctly. <laughs> um, I love on the app the collection reminder. Could you walk through a little bit how residents, once they've downloaded the app, uh, how they get that program, that daily reminder if they move, if they have to update that kind of information? Right. So um, right on the home screen, there's a collection um, schedule circle. You can click on that or tap on that. Um, enter your address. Uh, there's some other information available just to make things easier. What we really need in that section is, is your address. So if you type in your address, save it, it should show you your collection schedule for trash, recycling, and yard waste. Um, there's also a section where you need to toggle on the alerts. Um, we don't send alerts to people who don't want them. So there is a section where you need to toggle that on. You can toggle it on for just um, your collection reminders or just for news and alerts. And so the alerts are awesome. And you mentioned it's yard waste, um, 
recyclable recyclables uh, trash pickup. I, I recently had a resident ask about, well, could we get notification for street sweeping? Uh, curious if that's something that would be possible uh, and if that's something they take to you or, or how we could, if it's possible, uh, execute that. Right. So we've already been looking into this because this is something that um, I think would be of value to residents in those areas. So we're, we're currently working on a project um, together to get that information into a system that can make it available to us. Once that is up and running, we will take that information from them and put it on my Columbus and incorporate into reminders. That's a wonderful uh, progress report. If businesses or residents have other ideas, things they'd like to see uh, added to the app or things they would be helpful, uh, what suggestions would you have in terms of expressing that? Again, going through the chair of the department, going through the department, what's the best way for them to be able to express that? And again, just like street sweeping, kind of that light bulb goes off of maybe this isn't a bad idea. Yeah, I really appreciate you asking that question because we, we tried to make the app provide the services that the citizens want. But it's difficult to reach out to every citizen in the city of Columbus. We have done surveys and what have you. There is a feedback option right on the home page to where you can submit an email that comes directly to me. Um, I have an ongoing list of enhancement requests and I will take that request and add it to the list. And one last question. So we talked a little about 311. Just to be clear, uh, if there is a 311 phone app, the Department of Technology is not the department that is going to be resolving those cases. Um, when I started and learned a little bit more about 311, I think it was always assumed, I call 311, they're the ones who are closing it out. Um, just to clarify, it's not the Department of Technology, even though it comes through the app, that will be executing, uh, closing, or addressing uh, the photo that's provided or the issue, but it's actually shared with other departments who then have someone responsible. Absolutely. So the, each service request gets evaluated and then put in a queue for whichever department is responsible for resolving that request. So we are, you know, providing the technology, but public service is, is monitoring the service requests and putting them in the queues. Thank you. That. That's also applicable for uh, public safety. Um, when they get requests, they forward it on to public safety, then they respond and keep everybody up to speed on that. Uh, along the same lines, Tom, a question. You mentioned fiber earlier. Uh, where exactly are we with regards to fiber throughout the entire city? I know you mentioned like 500 miles or something like that. But through all the different public safety facilities, as well as other city facilities, do we have fiber everywhere, or are we still working to get that accomplished? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember Brown. We actually will be talking about that later. Um, Sheree actually okay. has some maps that will um, illustrate where um, the fiber network is currently. Thank but, you. Um, but I appreciate the question. A great question. It's something mm -hmm. a lot of residents have been asking about, and so I asked if they could include it. So if it's not answered in the presentation, we'll come back and answer it. That'll be fine. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I think we're ready for GIS. Absolutely. And I'd like to turn it over to Sheree, who will actually be talking about GIS and uh, um, some more offerings as well. Thank you great. very much. Good afternoon, Chair Cinziano and Council Member Brown. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, as Tom mentioned, my name is Shoray Elhami. I'm the citywide GIS manager. Along with me, my team, we're responsible for 38 applications, either directly or indirectly. These are all GIS applications. And in case you're wondering what geographic information system means, um, it's basically um, a technology that at any given time, um, if you grab your phone, look up for an address or look for finding out how to get from point A to point B, or maybe you're looking for a restaurant nearby or looking for an apartment to rent and you're sitting on a map of some sort. In the back end, you're using GIS technology. So at the city of, in city of Columbus, that is not all that we do with GIS. We do all that and a lot more. So when I was putting this together, I decided to just select a few of the applications and share those with you. One of them that is very much related to what Nicole just talked about is visualizing those 311 service requests. When those requests come in, they go to this application that we call it 311 service request heat map. I mean, you look at this map, the darker the areas, the larger the concentration of the service requests, and the lighter areas, of course, are less concentration. 
What you can do when you get to this application is that you can type in your address and then zoom into the area. And what that allows you is not only to make sure that the service request is actually placed in the right location, but also get answer to some of the earlier questions that you had, as in, who is it that is going to take care of this problem? Because you can see the name of the department. And more importantly, you can find out the status of the service request, whether it is closed or open. Some other GIS applications that we have provides other type of information, such as zoning. This is an example of that application. We are in the process of actually modernizing this app. But for now, the application that you see before you allows you to, once again, type your address or put your owner's name, or your own name, or whomever else. And again, after you zoomed in to an area, you can turn on the zoning application and learn more about that type of uh, information. You may also be in your neighborhood very interested in demographic data. We have a variety of demographic information. Say that in a neighborhood you're interested in um, learning about the number of senior citizens and not only at the time, and this is an example of many that we have and I just chose, um, if you're interested to know how many people over 65 live in a neighborhood and not only for that particular year, but throughout the years, how the trend has been changed, you can use GIS very effectively to pinpoint those types of information. Another ex example that I wanted to share with you and you touched on briefly early on is the snow and ice tracking application, or as we call, Warrior Watch. Warrior Watch is available to you from columbus.gov forward slash Warrior Watch, and of course, we use it during winter time. The primary purpose of the application, or the two questions that uh, when it was designed uh, was supposed to answer were in two folds. The first question was, has my street been treated? And by treated, it was meant either plowed or brined. So the first, image that you see before you, it's basically showing four different time intervals. And by looking up your address again and looking and going to your neighborhood, you can find out when the city trucks, snow plows have been in your neighborhood in the past 72 hours. The second question that the application is designed to answer is the priority of your street segments. Uh, the city's priorities are divided in three. And of course, if you have your um, lucky to be on priority one, your street will be plowed first and then priority two and priority three. So this application was launched in 2014. As I was putting these slides together, I picked up six snow events of the past two snow seasons to show you how popular this website has been, <laughs> especially when we have very large snowfalls. And the largest snowfall actually is on the bottom in November of 2014 when over 10,000 visitors hit the website on one single day. So obviously this year we've been lucky, in my opinion, since we don't have any ski <laughs> resorts here. Uh, we didn't get as, as much snow, but in uh, last year we certainly got quite a bit of snow, and especially in November of 2014. If you're interested in any of these web uh, uh, GIS applications, you can go to our GIS uh, homepage, columbus.gov forward slash GIS, and there you will actually find what we call a GIS portal. This is work in progress. We're putting a lot of time into getting a lot of different departments applications into their own depart into their own uh, space or folder, if you will. And uh, basically, one of them is Department of uh, Technology, which is the first one to uh, your left. And uh, one of the examples of the web maps in there is the fiber network, which was uh, mentioned earlier on. And just a, a few words about our fiber network and infrastructure. I thought I'll just put the goals of the fiber infrastructure, which is in four folds. And uh, one of the goals of, the, of putting the, this uh, extensive infrastructure in place for City of Columbus was to enhance economic development opportunities for City of Columbus, but also serve the city-owned buildings, specifically recreation centers, and also on the public safety side, serve 
fire station and police stations alike. And of course, last but not least, bridging the digital divide by provision of fiber throughout the city. The next one answers your question, Council Member Brown, earlier on, as in what is the coverage of the fiber for City of Columbus? This is the current, uh, the red lines throughout the city are the current uh, fiber lines, but of course, uh, phase D. Uh, which is coming up soon, is going to close the loop on 270, and that is the continuation of Columbus Traffic Signal System, or CTSS. Our fiber um, GIS database is one of the most sophisticated and complex uh, and GIS systems for fiber infrastructure actually in the nation um, because of the level of detail that is put in place in this database. At this point, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot more applications, but uh, I will stop and I'll be glad to ask uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Absolutely. I'll pass it to Tom also. To, it was about cameras and uh, relationship to fiber, where the fiber is located with cameras, body cameras. I'm sorry. Tom, what I was asking was that when there is an expansion right now, we're talking about putting more cameras up, the community cameras, and making certain that the areas to where those cameras are going to go is based upon the demands by the communities. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's fiber there and whether or not they all touch, touch base together. The DOT, the community, and public safety for where we're placing cameras. That, would that be an accurate assessment? That is correct. I mean, the, the, the different, like the Department of Public Safety would then work with those communities to make sure that they are aware of the cameras being in place. And um, I do know that one of the things, like for our, um, our fiber network, the first priority of that, the network is to, um, to work for anticipated needs. Any needs or, uh, of the city of Columbus would then be uh, the first priority of that network. Okay. And as I understand, we're building, obviously, we have in the plans a new fire station out on Wagner Road. And I assume that we have the fiber going out that far uh, on the east side of the city. If it's not there now, the, the, you know, the, obviously that would be in the plan to get all city facilities connected. Good, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the zoning uh, app uh, and that we're working on modernizing it. And when I got to take a tour of the department, I, I got to see a little preview and I was pretty excited by all the features and the hard work that's gone into it. Just curious when uh, that may be rolled out, what that timeline would be, because I think it's something residents and businesses will really uh, be impressed by. Thank you very much for bringing it up. Um, actually, this morning I was presenting that application, a similar application that is internal to the cabinet, and I got the same sentiments as yours. Uh, we're working with B our B building and uh, zoning department at this point on this new application, and uh, the first uh, series of feedback, we've received it, and we are working on addressing those, and I'm very much hopeful that within the next two months, uh, we will launch the application, and I will make sure that uh, you will hear about that. You know. I ask Mr. Diamond every time I see him almost, <laughs> how is it going in and what's the update? Because, uh, and that was a few months ago, um, it, it's pretty sharp and something I really think uh, your staff should be complimented. Uh, a lot of good information and I think something residents are really going to enjoy. Uh, on fiber, uh, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but the map is helpful. How much, many miles uh, of fiber does the city own? And is there a strategic plan for adding more? Uh, I know development uses it uh, strategically as a tool, but that's something I consistently is, what's going on with fiber? What's going on with fiber? Uh, you showed the map, but just curious, what's going on with fiber? <laughs> Yeah, the 500 miles, uh, which was mentioned in the slide, is the approximate mileage of the current fiber, and there is a plan and, um, and that 
really the, the manager, the fiber manager who's not here, uh, Bill Rogers, can answer those questions uh, in detail. Uh, and we can get back uh, with you with more details, but it is definitely um, expanding. And but um, one uh, figure that I've seen is putting about 600 miles uh, by the end of 2060. I appreciate that, and I really appreciate the map. I've had some community members come up and ask, we want fiber in this corridor, and I said, have you seen the map before? And they said, I didn't know it exists, and that's wonderful that it actually is here. Uh, now they want to go back and engage how to maximize that. Uh, don't know if you have any additional follow-up, Councilmember Brown. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, really looking forward to that zoning app uh, roll out in the next couple months. Not that I'm holding you to that, Thank you uh, very but much. when it's ready. Uh, finally, we'd like to introduce uh, Mr. White, uh, who's worked hard on the security issues. I, I think we always hear with technology, uh, data uh, concerns, pain, you know, we want to encourage people to take advantage uh, and the security component is so important and really appreciate you being here and looking forward to your comments and presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair Stenziano, Councilmember Brown. Um, I am here to talk about our information security program uh, and uh, the, the things that the city is doing in order to protect the citizens and, uh, and the data. Um, one of the services that we offer on our website is the ability to accept credit card payments. Uh, in order to accept credit card payments online and, and uh, process payments, we are actually subject to the payment card industry data security standard. Um, it's a rigorous, a rigorous set of security controls that we are evaluated against annually, and it is only one of the legal and regulatory requirements that fall on the City of Columbus and our, uh, our information security program. Um, Together, these, these, uh, these external requirements and our internal frameworks of best practices amount to hundreds uh, of individual security controls that we're carrying out and monitoring on an on a annual basis. Uh, these controls include things like reviewing security policy and procedures to make sure that they're staying up to date with our current threats and our current technologies. Uh, ensuring that people are, receive the appropriate awareness and training for security uh, so that they understand the threats that are out there in terms of phishing emails and, and uh, dangerous websites. Uh, additionally, we perform risk assessments and then we have uh, a suite of security tools that we use. Uh, some of the tools are, are protective where we can block known bad or known unnecessary uh, uh, information. Uh, such as the firewall, and then some of the technologies that we have are uh, detective technologies where we're detecting suspicious behavior. And, and when we do uh, detect suspicious behavior, we've got an information security response plan, and we respond uh, according to that plan in order to address whatever issue there may be. Um, all these activities are carried out by a team that's dedicated to ensuring that the citizens can access the digital services that we've discussed here today with high confidence. It was really eye-opening when I came out and met with some of your team, just how often there are threats or just kind of that every day you see some, something suspicious and, and being up to speed, ready to react. Is there anything as public, uh, members of the public, we could be doing to be aware of potential threats or uh, understand yeah, more that things are going on? I, I know it's a delicate balance between security and, and providing that to of the public at large, but right. just how we stay uh, informed of. Uh, the, there's a site called Stop, Think, Connect that uh, is out there for public consumption that has a lot of tips and guidelines for, uh, for the public on making sure that they use strong passwords and that they have uh, sensible security controls, that they have antivirus on their computers and, and different things like that. Um, with the city, we have several sources of threat intelligence that we monitor. Uh, and one of the associations that, that we're members of is called the Multi-State uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And it's a group of all 50 states as well as many uh, cities across the country that get together on a monthly basis. And we discuss uh, uh, d the MSISAC itself has threat intelligence, which they'll present. And then we discuss issues that are happening in different areas around the country. Uh, they'll also keep a threat level so that we understand when the MSISAC raises th the threat level, there are things that we need to do and pay attention to. Um, other things that we do as a city is just making sure that we're applying patches to our software and keeping them up to date so that we are closing any vulnerabilities that, uh, that are in the environment. Thank you. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Bill, what, what about redundancies? How, why don't you speak to that issue for a moment? Absolutely. Uh, 
a key piece of uh, data security is, is business continuity and, and protecting data. So uh, we have we have a business continuity plan. Our departments have business continuity plans in place to ensure that if there's a disruption of IT services, that they can continue uh, they continue with their job until we can restore uh, restore their IT services. We have multiple ways that, that we address redundancy in the IT services. We have uh, multiple data centers. Uh, so in the event of a disaster at one data center, we can uh, shift over to the other data center. If it's not that level of a disaster, we've got backups and we can recover and restore from backups. So uh, absolutely uh, securing copies of data and, and in depending on the criticality of, of the system, having actual redundancy built into the system is, is essential and, and we're doing that. Thank you. That's all the security questions I have. Mr. Diamond, if you want to take us home, I know we've oh, covered a lot. Well, well first, um, on behalf of everybody at the Department of Technology, we appreciate you taking the time and uh, scheduling the hearing today and actually um, asking some really great questions. So. So, thank you. so one more question, then. Yes. what is the future uh, of the Department of Technology? A new uh, director. It, well, absolutely. To the extent so, of that, that we talked, there is an interim director. Is there a timeline? Um, I mean, I, what that process they're potentially in, looks they're like? Currently, I, from what I understand, I, I don't know for sure, but um, they are in the process of, uh, of uh, interviewing different uh, directors. You know, so um, I, we anticipate within six weeks. We would think that we would have a new director, but again, um, I appreciate that information. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and the future is very bright. The future is very bright for the Department of Technologies. Okay. Uh, There's sunglasses floating around that's the city right. hall that's to that right. extent absolutely. is my understanding. Uh, uh, to that end, uh, we are now open up for the uh, public comment or question portion. My staff has told me there's been no speaker slips. I don't know if anyone in the audience uh, was planning or would like to Mike, ask any questions? If I may, I do want to ask Bill one more question. Uh, Bill, maybe you can speak to the issue about us expanding on uh, servers for law enforcement with their body-worn cameras. The question is going to come up and somebody needs to be prepared to answer it. Yeah, we have a, a team of people right now that uh, that are are addressing what they're, you know, trying to determine as accurately as possible what the requirements for the system would be in terms of capacity of storage, capacity of bandwidth, uh, the, the access controls, and, and we're looking at it from every angle and trying to make the, the, the most accurate uh, estimates about what those capacity requirements are. Obviously, um, you know, we will uh, build in a small margin for error, but, but uh, uh, part of the plan is to ensure that we don't uh, come out of the gates with a bottleneck. And if I'm not mistaken, again, the sheer volume of, of footage may be significant, so we have to be prepared, at least in the beginning stages, for implementation of the BWC program. Absolutely. The, uh, the collection and storage uh, and, and, and access to the information all needs to be uh, assessed very carefully to ensure that, uh, that, that we get the best possible system. Have you looked at any other cities at all who already have uh, body worn cameras and what they're doing with regards to storage. From what I understand, the numbers are significantly high. They are. It, it is. Uh, it's. It's. IT. Uh, the the numbers in IT continue to rise and rise and rise. And and you know, as we move forward and the Internet of Things uh, evolves into a reality where. Uh, people are now putting sensors uh, out there, and cameras are a form of a sensor, uh, and, and they expect these these sensors to be able to communicate back to uh, back to a, a data center somewhere to be stored and analyzed. Um, cameras are special in in that the the actual images themselves take up more space than most sensors, um, and these are. These are problems that DOT is, is continually uh, trying to stay on the forefront of and, and understand what's coming next while we you know, continue to, to operate uh, and, and keep services going the way they are today. We try to keep that eye into the future and make sure that we're planning appropriately. And to my knowledge, you guys are doing a really super job. I, I, from my previous experience, I, I appreciate that. Thank well, you very much. Thank you. Since I didn't see anyone jump up for uh, any questions, uh, I'll just move on to closing remarks. Really want to thank 
uh, everyone that took the time to attend today and those that are taking the time to watch the hearing at home. i uh, also like to take uh, time to thank the Department of Technology staff. Really appreciate your all's presentation. Uh, and especially Assistant Director Tom Diamond uh, for his per per participation, presentation, and kind of keeping me on task uh, and in the direction and allowing us to have this wonderful hearing. Uh, the information's always been very helpful uh, for a department I didn't know a lot about before. Uh, when I started in January, really have been impressed by the dedication caliber of not only working with so many of the other departments, but providing a, a service that our residents can and should be uh, proud of. Uh, I encourage those looking for more information uh, to visit the Department of Technology website at www.columbus.gov backslash technology or call 614-645-2550. Uh, you can also always call my office at 614-645-0884 or email me at mstanziano at columbus.gov with any additional questions. I also want to thank my staff, uh, Kevin McCain and Stephanie Magus, uh, for their help in having this wonderful uh, hearing today. Thank you all, and this hearing is adjourned.